everyone welcome to study travel tv live a show of news statistics and opinion i'm matthew knotts news editor of study travel magazine hello everyone i'm bethan norris senior editor of study travel magazine before we get started for the best viewing experience please put the call in side by side speaker view you will see an icon in the top right corner where you can select the view we are delighted to welcome you all today to this episode of study travel tv live in today's broadcast, we'll begin with a news story, and then we will be joined by our guests this week, Hugh and James, Membership Director at English UK, and Angela Ning, Director of UK and Europe at IAE Global Network. If you have any questions for the presenters or guest speakers or comments on the stories, please post them in the chat box and we will read them out at the end. A big thank you to the sponsor of this episode, Felker. Okay, let's start with our first story. ELT Association English UK has released a new position paper calling on the government to implement a number of measures to support the recovery and competitiveness of the sector. One of the main lobbying points for the association is a solution to the European group travel issue. Since October 2021, the UK government has not allowed ID card entry and withdrew from the list of travellers scheme. Last year, the recovery of group business was stronger in Ireland and continental Europe, English UK found in a survey of agents last year. English UK is also calling for an expansion and reform of the youth mobility scheme to more countries, particularly those in the EU, um, as well as larger caps and, and wider age ranges. Other visa related requests include in allowing students in the UK to apply for a new study visa without leaving, the restoration of work rights for long term language students and the recognition of accreditation UK across all visa streams. English UK said the reforms outlined in the paper would bring the UK in line with competitive nations, support recovery, uh, reverse policies that are deterring students and help the UK reclaim its position as the most popular destination for English, English language learning. So at this point, we'd like to welcome our guests this week, Hugh and Angela. Welcome to STTV Live. Hello. Hi. Hi. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. Um, Hugh and if we could start with you, uh, could you explain a little the, the group travel issue and what solution you would ideally like to see? Yes, indeed. Yeah. So, I mean, there's two kind of related issues here, really. One is that since Brexit, um, you have to travel as, as do non-EU visitors on a passport. Um, now, our research found that a, a significant number of um, EU citizens, particularly juniors, did not hold passports. And given the time and the expense of obtaining them, that has created a barrier to students coming here in groups uh, in particular. Um, a related issue, which I think is um, probably even more pertinent, is one that a lot of school groups, particularly the mini stays that happen outside the summer seasons, um, tend to be with um, third country nationals as part of the school group. So they might be refugees, asylum seekers, other third country nationals that, that live in an EU country. And in many cases, they will not only have to obtain a passport, which they will already have, but they will need to get a visa. And there's the additional cost, the time, the effort of getting that. If one of them fails to get a visa, then the school group simply doesn't happen, particularly under equality legislation, which says that, you know, if one, one child in a group, in a school group can't travel, then none can travel. So that's the problem that we're faced with. And our um, research that we've done um, has shown that this has had a substantial impact particularly on those out of season mini stay groups. I think that's where those groups are much more price sensitive and where there's larger numbers of third country nationals. So that's the problem essentially. And uh, we have put together a group um, that cuts across our industry. I think where we can find allies, this is the best way to proceed. So we have a, well, a two, what we call the Tourism Industry Council, which is Tourism Alliance, UK Inbound, Beta, ABTA, 
um, one or two other bodies as well have joined together in order to um, provide a paper on this. We've done two surveys last year. We're possibly going to do another survey next month of this as well. Um, because we need robust data for government. Now, we've been lobbying on this issue for three years. We first um, went into it in the EU withdrawal bill, um, and the government didn't change their position then at that point. Um, but it seems that, that we're finally cutting through because UQVI have put a policy team on this. So having said no for a number of years, they're now reviewing it. And we've passed them all our survey data and our proposed solution, which is basically a, a collective youth group travel scheme and a recognition of the list of travellers schemes for those third country nationals. So wheels of government move slowly, but we think we're getting somewhere. OK, thank you. And um, do you think um, it would be possible to see this solution extended perhaps to other markets outside Europe, uh, maybe such as Japan and Korea? We've proposed that idea, yes. I see okay. no reason not to. If one of the main objections from government is that we don't want to discriminate in favour of EU citizens relative to citizens from the rest of the world, then why don't we just extend the idea to... Because uh, we're talking about school groups here. We're not talking about those who present any kind of risk in terms of you know, overstaying their visas or whatever. Excellent. Um, Angela, do you think that would be uh, of, um, of benefit in, in the markets that you recruit in? Yes, definitely. I think the purpose of Metro by English UK would likely benefit agents like us and recruiting, recruiting students from Japan, South Korea, China, Hong Kong, Thailand and other countries. Um, so this means um, it would be, make it easier for agents like us to promote and sell English language course in the UK. And uh, also the visa related request would also make the UK a more attractive destination. This would potentially increase the number of the students coming to uh, from this market, um, which is translate into increased business for the agents. So the reform outlined in the English UK position paper would possibly uh, impact agents recruiting from this market. OK, Hi. thanks. And uh, Angela, again, um, in terms of English language programmes, where does the UK rank currently for IAE? Would any of these policy changes suggested by English UK help the UK to grow market share, do you think? Um, well, IAE's uh, operational head office is actually based in Sydney, Australia. So we historically send more students to Australia. So the UK actually in our group ranks the fourth of the most, most popular destinations uh, for the English study after the USA, Canada and Australia. But the proposed policy change mean, uh, can suggest by English UK uh, could help the UK to grow the market share and uh, regain its position in as the most popular destinations. Um, this also, I think, can make the UK a more attractive destination for the students from all over the world. So I'm sure it will lead to increased demand for the English programs in the UK, and it can be benefit for both in the industry and the agents like us. Okay, yeah, very good. Uh, hopefully there's a, there's a government minister listening. Yeah, um, Huyen, would you say that this issue is, is the most sort of realistic or, or sort of likely of the of the proposals that you've put yeah forward. i mean that's why we're foregrounding it essentially um yes it is the most likely to be achieved i think in terms of our major asks of government yeah okay simply okay. because we've been at it for quite a long time we've collected a whole ream of data on this we've lobbied hard on it and uh, it looks like we're making progress because you know government rather than saying no our uh, actually putting a team to work on this excellent okay fingers crossed um so let's take another story uh next up there have been uh, several indicators of recovery in the sector in recent weeks um including through uh, data reports government plans and study travels uh, uh study travel magazines reporting in agent markets in Australia, student numbers are heading back towards pre-pandemic levels with more than 256,000 student arrivals in the first quarter of this year, an increase of 143% compared with the previous year and only 24% below the first quarter of 2019. In Western Australia in particular, recovery looks strong with course commencements in January this year were more than double the totals in 2019. 
Um, in Asia, South Korea hosted 200,000 international students for the first time in February this year. And the Japanese government has announced ambitions to host 400,000 international students by 2033 and to, to be sending half a million students overseas by the same year, uh, an upgrade on the previous targets announced last year. Meanwhile, Study Travel Magazine has been gauging the pulse of student markets at ST Alfre conferences around the world in recent weeks. In Turkey, Agency Association UED told delegates that the sector has already returned to pre-pandemic levels and that 40% of members predict growth of more than 10% in language business this year, with even stronger predictions for higher education. And uh, Study Travel Alfie Brazil, agents spoke about a booming outbound market in 2023. Uh, agents highlighted the UK, Ireland and New Zealand as growing markets for language study, uh, particularly due to delays in travel visas uh, from Canada currently, um, as well as demand for specialist team programmes, high-end secondary courses and premium agency service. OK, so Angela, let's come to you first this time. For the markets that you operate in, do you see similar stories of recovery? Uh, yes, I think so. So we can see some similar situation. So we can see the inquiries and the interest in the studying English uh, recovering. Um, I think the report of the number of enrollment in English uh, language program in Australia, the UK, New Zealand, Canada, and especially come from the mainland China, uh, Japan and South Korea is generally the case. Um, but I think the recovery is a little different country by country. Um, overall at IAE, we can see about 70% back and or return in the business from the pandemic. But some markets like South Korea are a slow, a slow than the others. And um, that is more because of the political and economic uh, factors. And, um, but we can feel the demand uh, is there. And also we are setting up our new IA China office with uh, emphasis on our direct sales, direct recruitment. So it will help us further uh, tap into this potential uh, in the Chinese market. So it seems there is a positive trend of the recovery. And uh, currently we can see the recovery is positive and uh, we are working on our partner schools to deliver the quality students. Okay, very good. Um, uh, Huyen, we, we know that UK ELT con continued to struggle uh, in 2021 with a, a further <laughs> decline on the previous year. Um, I know that English UK will be releasing its, its full year data report on 2022 in, in the next couple of weeks. Um, but are, are you able to give us any any sort of insight, early insights from that? Yeah, I mean, basically, I mean, the, the, the headline is that uh, if you will have seen our quick data last year, so we collect yes. quarterly data throughout throughout the year and then compare that with our annual stats it's it's roughly aligned so there's roughly going to be about a 50 percent recovery that we will see in 2022 um obviously that headline figure masks great differences across markets so you've got virtually nothing in 2022 for china and russia for different but very obvious reasons in both those countries but then you've got more resilient markets i mean saudi arabia the gulf markets and latin america all seem to have done relatively well europe's perhaps a bit off the off the average um so we will we'll release full figures in due course so that'll be uh, available at our agm on the 12th um what i would say for 2023 is that we're looking at somewhere in line with our predictions so somewhere around a 70 to 80 percent recovery based on pre-pandemic volumes which is looking good and i think what's driving the difference is a is a bounce back in the junior markets um this summer yeah okay good well thing. let's see but i mean obviously this is anecdotal at this point <laughs> Okay, thank you. And uh, Angela, the Japanese government is targeting 500,000 students overseas by 2033, a target that includes government scholarships, university study abroad programs and privately funded study abroad. Agency association JOS estimated the total size of the outbound, outbound market at 200,000 in 2018. So this is rather an ambitious target. How realistic do you think that it is? It is, it is. So our head office is currently in Tokyo. So we are a Japanese firm actually. 
And the target set by the Japanese government is certainly an ambitious one, especially considered that the outbound market was just about 200,000 in 2018. But it is important to note that the Japanese government it has already, already taken some actions to helping to encourage more students to study abroad and the promising internationalization in education. So it is not impossible, it is possible. So if the Japanese government continues to invest in education, study abroad programs, and uh, if the pandemic situation is improved, which it is now, so we may see the increase in the number of the Japanese students studying abroad. Um, but it's important to note that there are also have some other factors um, that may affect this goal, such as the economics conditions, political factors, and maybe the social attitudes towards to the studying abroad. So it's difficult to predict with uh, certainty whether it is can target that amount um, by 2033, uh, if it's a reality. But our company, um, I Global, we will be working with very closely with the Japan, with the uh, government agency to assist this goal, and uh, it's certainly an an ambition and a common uh, goal, and uh, we will support this approve uh, approach. Very good. I'm I'm sure everyone will be very happy if they do reach that target. Um, <laughs> do you have any? Um, you, you said the government have taken some actions already. What what, what kind of things that scholarship? investments or what, what kind of action have they taken? So actually, I, from what I know, the government uh, gives some scholarship to the students uh, who are going abroad. If they are, they are kind of like uh, good students in some, if they can reach some certain level, okay. is, uh, I mean, the outstanding academic, mm. and then they can apply for some government scholarship. The government, it means the Japanese government. And at the same time, as far as I know, Japanese government also uh, invest some money into the inbound study, which is they welcome studying from overseas to Japan as well. Okay, very good. Thank you. Okay, next up, we'll, we'll take a, a roundup of some of the other stories that have been in the news since our last um, Study Travel TV live show. And uh, firstly, the USA has announced a $25 increase in non-immigrant visa fees, including F and M student visas and J exchange visas, uh, which will now be $185 uh, from the end of May. The raise was less than the 50% hike first proposed by the Department of State, and several public comments on the impact on the international education sector were received during the consultation period. And staying on the subject of visas, uh, Universities Canada criticised the government for failing to make necessary investments in the immigration system to address delays in work and study visa processing in the recent federal budget. The association also called for greater investment in scholarships and mental health support for students. Agents in Nepal are battling against a government policy that means no objection certificates or NOCs that are required for study abroad will no longer be issued for vocational and language study. Um, agents and associations called the policy discriminatory against consumer choice uh, and said that they would take the issue to the Supreme Court if necessary. Uh, Trinity International Education announced a new UK summer centre at Berkhamsted School to its portfolio for 2023. Summer school English and digital English courses will be offered there. Uh, Italian language provider Academia Italiana has expanded with the opening of a new centre located in the historic heart of Napoli. Uh, the school will offer a range of Italian uh, language courses, including exam preparation, Italian for specific purposes, teacher training and Italian plus programmes. And finally, ETS has announced a series of new developments in the TOEFL IBT English language test, including a shortened exam that should take less than two hours, as opposed to the previous three hour test, a simplified registration process and increased score transparency. OK, so um, Angela, coming back to those uh, visa issues that we mentioned there, have you experienced delays with, with Canada as described by Universities Canada or, or with any other destinations for that matter? Yes, um, because we have a Toronto office, IA Toronto, so we recently heard for, uh, some feedback from them and mentioned there's a slightly delay in the visa processing in Canada. 
So actually, the similar delay has also been reported in the UK as well for the UK visa application during the peak season, usually in July and August last year. So I believe the visa processing time may vary depending on the range of factors. So such as of the volume of the, of the application, the time of the year. And so like we are now having some summer school students coming to the UK, we asking them to go for the visa as soon as possible. And because I'm sure in the summertime, it will be our peak time for the UK visa application as well. So we are working very closely with the local government, with the UK embassies based in the different area. So we help uh, the students to, to apply for the visa as well. So yeah, we, we can see the delay, but we are working on that. Okay, thank, thank you. you. And uh, Huon, we heard about one of your members, Trinity International mm, Education yes. there. And so far this year, we've reported on a number of summer centre expansions uh, for the likes of St Andrews College, Language Schools, Beads, UKLC and Samyad. Will the summer offer be back to pre-COVID capacity this year, do you think? <laughs> That's a that's a big question as to whether whether <laughs> we can sort of say that it will be exactly at a hundred percent of the volume. I think things are looking very good for a number of organisations, and as I said, I think the overall recovery over the year as a whole is likely to be somewhere around a seventy to eighty percent mark. So yeah, we we have an ambition to get back to pre-pandemic volumes within the next couple of years or so, and we're looking to looking to develop that. I think it is a bit of a mixed picture. Um, you know, Chinese groups are likely to take until 2024 to recover, for example. Um, others might be impacted. Other schools have not operated um, until this year. So therefore, they will be finding their feet again. Um, there, there might also be staffing issues in some locations. So all these, all these factors might impact upon going back to a full recovery, but certainly the trajectory is looking good, yeah. Just, just picking up on that, actually, Hugh, and with the residential centres and, and several of these opening this year, do you think that's in, in some response, uh, in, 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 to some degree, a, a response to the, the sort of homestay uh, issues that, that we've spoken about in the past, that maybe the residential seems a safer bet to, to sort of guarantee a certain number of beds for the summer? Definitely. I mean, some some evidence that, that, that homestays are going to be a little bit better than this year um, from some people, although if volumes are higher, then that won't necessarily um, carry through to be there being, you know, a lot of lot of capacity within within the homestay market. Uh, but certainly, yes, we've seen that a move towards residence accommodation as being probably the safer bet. Yeah. OK, thank you. Um, uh, Angela, with, with regards to the uh, TOEFL test that we mentioned there, this, this shortened exam follows a, a similar streamlining of the Pearson PTE test, which was announced in 2021. Um, do you see this trend of the, the shorter tests uh, as a positive for the student? Yeah, it is. So um, all the tests are welcome because uh, for the students who come into the UK, after the English study, they may need to go for the higher education and then most of the higher education degree courses, they can accept all sorts of English tests, which is they say it's all assessment. So I believe that's some uh, advantage for the students who cannot book the, the other tests. So it will be some extra bonus for them. Okay, thank you. Right, and moving on, <clears throat> just one more story to finish with. Uh, the winners of the Study Travel Secondary School Awards 2023 were announced last week in a special gala dinner during the Study Travel Alfie Secondary Focus London event. Uh, the 13 categories of the unique uh, partner voted awards covered schools, agencies, service providers and associations. Four organisations won their respective category for a third time, Bright World Guardianships and Education, Cats Global Schools, and CAPSI, and Mercedes College. There were also several first-time winners on the evening. Uh, congratulations to all of the winners and finalists. Okay, so that brings us up to date with all of the news for this week. At this point, we'll open up to the audience to see if there are any questions for our guests or for the Study Trouble team. And, and these can be on any of the stories or topics we have discussed. And just while we're waiting for um, 
any uh, questions to to come in there. Um, so, Hewan, we, we gathered that uh, English UK has a as a, a parliamentary reception um, coming up in in a couple of weeks. Yeah. What, what can you tell us about that? Yeah, it's in the Terrace Pavilion. Um, lunch is provided. Light lunch is provided. Um, Thirty pounds plus fat for our members. A little bit higher, but not much more than that for non-members as well. That's Thursday, the eleventh of May, one thirty in Parliament for a couple of hours. So uh, hopefully we'll get a good good turnout of MPs there. Um, the, the event is being hosted by Stephen Hammond MP, who's a long serving MP and also a very warm supporter of our industry down in Wimbledon. So we're very pleased to have him hosting the event. And uh, hopefully there'll be a few other guest speakers as well coming. But uh, mainly we hope that it's a chance for members and others and anyone who wants to come to uh, meet, meet some MPs. So please, please do make a date for it if you can. Okay, and uh, Angela, just a quick one for you. You mentioned that you're opening a new office in China. Um, is is this part of a wider expansion policy at IAE? Is there any any other expansion plans on the horizon? Yes, we are also looking for other destinations, and uh, because as a global company, we want to set up everywhere we can, and then to get more students coming to the UK to support the UK education education industry. Okay, very good. Well, let us know when you do. Yes, definitely. Thank you. Okay, I don't see any questions in there, Beth. No, I think uh, people are just saying thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much for Indeed. watching. <laughs> Okay, uh, that looks like the end of our audience Q&A, which brings us to the end of this week's Study Travel TV Live. Uh, you can visit the Study Travel TV Live page on the Study Travel Network, uh, which you can see on the screen there under the uh, magazine section in the menu. And um, on that page, we will announce the guest speakers for our next broadcast. Um, and you will be able to find a recording of today's episode from tomorrow, as well as all of the past episodes on there. Um, so that's it for today. We'd like to say a big thank you to our special guests this week. Um, Angela, thank you for your time and insights today. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Hewan, thank you for joining us again and sharing your thoughts. We look forward to seeing you all again soon. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Uh, and thank you again to our sponsor this week, Felka. And thank you to everyone for watching. Goodbye.